cheaper than our producer's underage sister, edgier than the stuff shown on late night television. Newer than Kim Kardashian's ex, live from Orlando, it's Crazy Train Radio. King of Horror, Andy G. Thank you for listening to Crazy Train Radio. To keep the new and exciting content coming, I've got some info from some friends of the show. Speaking of friends of Crazy Train Radio, I'd like to give you the interview that Croc did with one of the true icons of horror, Robert England. Do you enjoy murder, madness, and mayhem? Then find it with the King of Horror, Andy G, and the Mad Cat Guru of Geek Keith on Talking Terror Presents on blogtalkradio.com and iTunes. Talking Terror Presents, where no film is too good or too bad. Stay scared. <laughs> These days, there's no shortage of people ready to tell you what to do. I'm not one of those people because I'm here to talk about Yingling Lager from America's oldest brewery, a company that was told what to do several times over and generally ignored the advice. I could say that that's a reason to drink it, but that's your call. Some folks like beer that stands for something. Others like beer that tastes like something. If you're looking for taste, look for the rich amber color of Yingling Lager. It's a sign of a well-crafted, distinctly satisfying lager. If you want a beer that stands for something, consider the beer that stood for something since 1829. For six generations, Yingling has chosen brewing right over brewing big, every time. Yingling just stands for beer. Says something about Yingling Lager and the people who drink it. I won't tell you what to drink, but think about it. We've survived for 185 years because we make darn good beer. Yingling, American owned, family operated. DG Yingling and Son, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Please enjoy responsibly. Greetings, cinema fans. Cadaver here. I'm part of a titular duo from Touch Me Philly Productions Cinema After Hours. Abigail and I are Philly's only undead, I mean live horror hosted events. We screen local independent films and have the spookiest events for you. Cinema After Hours Halloween Edition on October 26th, featuring the world premiere of the Half Life Horror from Hell from director Mark Master. Starring WWF legend Jimmy Superfly Snuka. Oh, no! Join us on October 26th at 8 p.m. at Philomoka, 531 North 12th Street, and visit www.touchmefilly.com for more info. Simply yours. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Hey, folks. It's currently available on iTunes and your local cable outlets, video on demand. The movie is The Last Showing. It's a psychological thriller that stars Finn Jones, who you know from Game of Thrones, and Emily Barrington from 24. The guest on the line now, as we were joking a minute ago, was probably the best damn Pinocchio to come out of the teenage drama workshop. 
But in bigger circles, he's known as Freddy Krueger. Robert, how are you doing? Robert England, everybody. I'm fine, man. And uh, I was the best damn Pinocchio. You know, I had a, I had a, a second act joke in that movie where I ran across the stage uh, in, the, in that play with uh, arrows in me. Uh, I'd been shot. I, you know, Pinocchio, is a, he'd been shot at with arrows. And since he's made of wood... Uh, arrows can do him no harm, obviously. And every time I ran across the stage every night, I, uh, I added more arrows into my, uh, my little shorts and my little vest that I was wearing and my funny little hat, Tyrolean hat, <laughs> Italian Alps hat. And, uh, I, I'd had styrofoam, you know, inside the vest so I could add more and more arrows and I stuck arrows between my teeth. And and I stuck arrows in my butt and down my pants, and the the laugh got bigger and bigger every night. And I really believe that that, that laugh uh, back when I was twelve and a half years old uh, in that in that children's theater workshop that that's the reason I've survived till today because I can still remember how great that felt. You know, you getting your first laugh as an actor. Well, the as we said, the last showing is available now here in America. It was made in the UK. If you want to check out the information, best way, best way to do so, facebook.com slash the last showing. Uh, well, we know the movie is one about a Dane Berg, the berated uh, projectionist, which is you, uh, yeah. who takes a unlucky couple and tries to cast them into this twisted film. Well, he's, uh, you know, has uh, a call- go ahead, yeah, sorry. He's, he's, uh, He's been laid off. He's, as they say in England, you know, he's been made redundant. Uh, and, uh, so what happens is he, he wants to punish the manager who puts, forces him into retirement. And the manager has, has made him wait out his retirement by serving popcorn at the uh, concession stand in the lobby. And he's humiliated. He has to wear that dreadful day glow orange vest. He has to wear a horrible paper cap. And he's this brilliant projectionist. You know, he's, he can run every kind of projector. But he's stuck there uh, and, and humiliated. And he begins to uh, come upon this plan uh, using Radio Shack technology, GoPro cameras, the existing closed-circuit TVs in the movie theater, and he volunteers for the midnight movie shift. And he has his revenge on the manager by starring this unsuspecting couple that have come to see a Wes Craven movie at midnight, an old Wes Craven movie. And he starts filming them, and he makes his own horror movie involving the manager, and uh, and it's it's so it's a little bit Phantom of the Opera, it's a little bit one hour photo, you know, with uh, Robin Williams. There's even a little bit of the late uh, great actor director Richard Attenborough in it. I, I, I borrowed a little bit uh, from a, a film he did called Seance on a wet afternoon, uh, a, a kind of weird '60s uh, psychological thriller about a famous murder spree in England. So it was kind of like. Uh, my uh, my return to a new great character, but this time out of makeup. Yes, this is true. Uh, now, the, the movie was directed by a Phil Hawkins. Uh, when you were approached about this project, uh, what m- made it stand out? Was it Phil's uh, idea with it, talking with you, or was it the script? What was it that sold well, you? Well, I knew that Phil was this wonderfully gifted, talented director, from Manchester, England, who'd been on the Steven Spielberg reality show a couple of seasons ago called The Lot. And uh, so he had this great reputation. And uh, I love the script. He'd gone through many, many, many drafts on it, and I think he kind of he fixated on this one draft and kind of tailored it for me. Uh, he knew, I guess he'd seen something I'd done, uh, guest starring on television or something, where he knew that this was the right kind of character for me. And then when I realized that he had Finn Jones from Game of Thrones and Emily, and I didn't know Emily from 24. She hadn't done 24 yet. I knew Emily from uh, The White Queen, which is this great uh, stars channel, uh, sort of historical, lurid, sexy 
uh, mini series about Richard the Third. It's kind of like the Borgias on HBO, and I knew Emily from that. So I, I mean, I was really excited about doing the film. You know, good script, good director. I was familiar with both of the both of the actors, so I hopped on the next plane and we shot it last summer, all last summer up uh, just outside of Manchester, England. Now, I remember hearing it, and I kind of found it funny coming from you. I did hear another interview you did over there. I think you were in the U.K. doing a convention or something along the lines, or those lines, and you were talking about the little schoolgirls as you were wrapping up filming that in certain mornings oh, for the matinee. Yeah. Well, you know what happened is we shot from midnight till noon, and we thought we were being real smart because we would have the whole suburban mall cinema to ourselves. But what happened last summer was the number one movie in the world was Despicable Me 2, you know, with the minions running around. And so in the lobby of this upscale uh, suburban uh, English mall cinema, they had these giant minions in the lobby, and they moved up their matinee from 12 noon till 10 a.m. in the morning. This is a new experiment they're doing with programming uh, in the U.K. in the summer because uh, – uh, uh, you know, kids are get up early, and kids like that. Around ten in the morning, they're they're at their best. They've had their breakfast, they're alert, and uh, they thought it was a good time to like have a have the first screening of the matinee schedule. So here it would be like be like ten in the morning, quarter to ten in the morning, and uh, Emily and I and 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 Finn would be walking around. We'd have blood all over us, and and Finn was all disheveled, and uh, Emily was all disheveled, and we'd be walking around, and then we would look, and the doors would open. And here we were, blood-stained and messy, and standing there just, you know, exhausted from, like, working for 12 hours. And you'd see these uh, these beautiful little lovely, you know, uh, peaches and cream complected English schoolgirls come in, you know, all of them with their little Hello Kitty backpacks on, and they all, you know, they all dress up very properly with their with their mummies and their daddies. They were all coming to see the matinee of Despicable Me, and here they look up, and they're right past the minions in the lobby are Finn and Emily and myself standing around with blood all over us. I don't know what traumatic, you know, experiences we, you know, communicated to those poor kids, but it was very <laughs> surreal to say the least. Well, let me ask you this then with that particular situation. Did any of the parents recognize you guys at least? Oh, yeah. I mean, they all knew Finn because in England, Game of Thrones is even bigger than it is here. So they would recognize Finn, you know, who's a cross between Heath Ledger and Orlando Bloom, but he's taller than both of them. I think, God, Finn must be 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, so they would like, they, they, they recognize Finn first. I was, I've been wearing a beard for the last 10 years, and uh, I shaved my beard for this part, and I gained weight, and I was wearing funny little 70s tinted glasses, and I had a dreadful English mustache kind of a ratty mustache. And so I wasn't so quickly recognized. I was actually kind of anonymous. Uh, but they all knew who Finn was, and, and and then eventually they would figure out, and the first time, first time somebody recognized me, then everybody went, oh, that's Robert England. So, they, and that was strange, too. Here they are trying to bring their child to a, a safe movie-going experience, and Freddy Krueger's lurking around the lobby in a blood-stained uh, sweater vest. <laughs> What a shock, but yeah. uh, that actually leads to uh, my next question with the recognizability. Uh, you, in particular, are one of those guys, and rightfully so, I guess because of your popularity in s certain genres, uh, you do a lot of conventions, which I know you did one last weekend. I think it was in Texas. You got one in Baltimore this upcoming weekend. You know, you're bouncing around all the time. Well, this Outside year. of the conventions. Uh, how much do people really notice you when you're not filming? Oh, well, you're, I, you know, I, you're going day to day. I get mobbed all the time. I mean, I can go for two or three days in my hometown, uh, which is a resort community in the summer, and I'm okay. I mean, I, I'm pretty anonymous. But if I go into one of the resort hotels for a drink or if I'm walking on, on the beach in front of one of the hotels or something, you know, I, I, I get mobbed pretty regularly, uh, especially with out-of-towners. 
um, as opposed to just the Southern California people who might be coming for a, what do they call it now, a staycation. But, you know, this is the 30th anniversary of Nightmare on Elm Street. And I also have four movies coming out. So I've been saying yes to every Comic-Con and every film festival that I'm invited to that I can fit in my schedule this year because it's an opportunity for me to talk to people like yourself. It's an opportunity for me to do the, the you know the morning talk shows in in Baltimore or San Antonio or Toronto and I get the word out about my movies. I'm really proud and happy of my work and of the work that Phil Hawkins and and Phil and Emily have done on last showing. It's a great, tight little psychological thriller. And it's out now for Halloween. So this has been an opportunity for me to get the word out about last showing, uh, which is, you know, it's a low-budget film, and so we don't have a huge advertising budget. And by by saying yes and attending a lot of the cons, when I do my panels and my question and answers and when I do my, my, my publicity with the press, uh, it, it's just a whole other way of getting free publicity for not only last showing, but I have a great little horror movie coming out early next year called Fear Clinic. Uh, also. Oh, so that's next year then? Yeah, well, that's coming out in February. But you see, up until recently, we were going to bring it out for Halloween. Uh, okay, because I, I was going to ask you because I just read that. Yeah, we decided to postpone it until February. It's a really great month to bring out a uh, uh, horror because everybody's over with Christmas. Everybody's over with New Year's. Everybody started to pay their bills for the holidays. And it's February, and a lot of people are snowed in or it's raining. And it's just a great time of year uh, uh, for to launch horror. Uh, I've had a couple of really big hits over the years that have come out in that month. And so we decided to postpone it. It also gave Robert Hall, the great uh, Robert Hall, our, our wonderful director of Fear Clinic, it gave him a chance to spend more time with the post-production uh, CGI effects, as well as uh, uh, Thomas Decker, uh, our wonderful leading man in Fear Clinic. It gave him a chance to uh, work on the music, because I think Thomas is collaborating uh, with some other people and doing part of the score for Fear Clinic. So it's a real cast family, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, uh, collaboration that we're all on here with this movie. And, you know, it began as webisodes, some really brilliant webisodes that we did on the Internet, raising the, the bar, so to speak, for production value on the Internet. I mean, I don't know how long people can wash kitty cats getting a bath, but... Uh, I'm a little over that, you know, I'm a little over uh, people falling down and babies and cats getting washed. So, I, I you know, we, we did a, we did the webisodes for Fear Clinic and uh, for FearNet.com, and now we've got FearNet, the movie coming out in February. So these two films, I'm 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 real happy with, and uh, and, and you know, last showing uh, for me is a, is a real a departure for a lot of my fans. I haven't done this kind of work since I was in the theater. Or earlier in my career when I was doing guest stars on television or other movies. So it's uh, kind of, I've, I've kind of come full circle to the kind of character work that I was known for before Freddie. And I, and it really came out great. This Phil Hawkins is amazing. So I am like, I'm off to Baltimore, you know, tomorrow morning. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hopping through Atlanta and I'm on my way to Baltimore because Dave Hagen throws a great show, and I've been I've been in his show in New Jersey for years, which is just one of the best conventions there are because it's really horror, science fiction, uh, fantasy centric, with a, a real nod towards the horror. And so, Monster Mania uh, is going to be going on in Baltimore this weekend, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of my co-stars and a lot of actors that I've worked with over the years that I know and like. Uh, I think there's going to be some walking dead people there. There'll be some zombies. There'll be some some nightmare on Elm Street casualties. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I want to get to the cons in a second there, but in your last answer, you mentioned about effects and CGI and all that stuff. You've been in the business with TV, film, and stage for about 40 years now. And just about right. Would you yeah. say that stuff? Would you say that stuff's Pardon? the biggest change in the business? Hello. 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 Did I lose you? I'm right here. Can I? Can you hear me? 
I got you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I was saying, you know, with the special effects and everything else like that, you had uh, been around the block for about 40 years now in the different mediums. Would you say the special effects is the biggest change you have seen over time? No, I, you know, I, I would have said that a couple of years ago, but the new big change is the camera. You know, we're shooting on digital now, and the cameras are smaller and lighter. And with the GoPro camera and with the drone cameras now, you, we can just do things that are uh, amazing, and we do them faster and cheaper. Um, CGI, we're still experimenting. Uh, you know, I think we step over the line too much, and sometimes in films – balance is off with CGI. Uh, there's too much, C there's more CGI than there needs to be and, and, and a movie that should be grounded in reality a little more turns starts looking a little bit animated. Uh, on the other hand, a movie that can take that style and, and, and really, be, really be supported by that style and use real live actors, when that works, it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience and I use films like Avatar and films like The Life of Pi, and especially that great, great, fun film this summer that surprised everybody, Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, which to me is, is I, just, I just went crazy for it. I just thought it was wonderful because everybody in the film, from the animators to the effects people to the makeup effects people to the writers to the director to the actors, everybody was on the same page with that movie. And I find that getting rarer and rarer because people think they can fix everything in post-production with special effects and CGI now. And yet you could tell that everybody was on the same page with Guardians of the Galaxy from the get-go. And that's why that movie is so wonderful and, and, and successful. And you definitely have your credibility in mentioning that. But for when you did Freddy, uh, how was that? Did you guys have to be on the same page for all those films to work, or did you feel you're on the same page? I think what we did is we, yeah, we kind of had this organic mutation. During the course of the first seven Freddy movies, uh, effects were changing from film to film. New technology was being discovered, but we were also very low budget. Uh, New Line Cinemas films were, were, were the, the, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise films, were very low budget until perhaps part seven. And so we were this, this sort of family, this sort of ensemble of people working, and we kind of followed the fans' lead. I think perhaps a couple of times, perhaps we went too far, but we did so intentionally. We followed the lead of the fans. The fans loved the sense of humor, and they also loved some of Freddie's uh, commenting on popular culture, kind of taking the cop popular culture of that moment and jamming it down his victims' throats, so to speak. So I think perhaps we jumped the shark, as they say in showbiz, yeah. in part six. But there's some, you know, there's some, I mean, the fans love part three. They love part four. Three and four are a great double bill. Uh, I'm really fond of the visuals in part five. And my favorite is part seven, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, because it's very meta, it's very deconstructed. We made that film for the fans. And every time I see it, I find some new little subtle thing, a little Easter egg that Wes has hidden in there in terms of interpretation or something that's going on, uh, you know, that's kind of surreal in the film. Uh, well, early on, before we... Thankfully, I noticed early about the record button there, but you were talking about your book there. And because yeah. you mentioned Wes, Wes had it actually written an introduction for you uh, and was talking about different things, just the type of person you are in the introduction. Uh, do you still communicate often with Wes, or what kind of relationship yeah, I, do you guys have? We, we talk, I, I see Wes sometimes at screenings, or I, I run into him at an Oscar party sometimes. Uh I think Wes broke his leg or something last year. So, you know, he was out of action for a while. But I hear he's all better now and out and about. I know I just missed him. Uh, gosh, I think it was in Boston last year. He was at a, he was invited to a, uh, a quite a, a, a wonderful event at a bookstore there with Salman Rushdie. 
the famous author. And I and I think Wes was part of the the panel discussion there. Uh, and I ran into I was there at almost the exact same time. But our paths crossed, and uh, I, I didn't see Wes, but I ran into some really enterprising fans who had, had taken some wonderful memorabilia, and Wes was, was kind enough to sign it for them. And then I, I, I ran into them. I can't remember whether it was at my hotel or at the airport, but they, they found me. And so I was able to sign the same piece of memorabilia that Wes did, which enhanced its value, you know. But they were very enterprising young fans. But that's the closest I've come to seeing Wes in the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, well, and I guess I can wrap up with this, uh, with the cons and all. And you just mentioned about signing unique uh, pieces of memorabilia. Uh, is there anything that really stands out that, a fan has brought to you, whether you see him at, out and about, like you said, airport, hotel, whatever, or at a convention that really surprised you. you know, wow. Well, you know, that, I, cool. I, I go, I, I, you know, for a while I was just going to Europe uh, to, a, to, a, to a wonderful collecting show in London and, uh, and a wonderful collecting show in Germany. And then I would do, you know, my film festivals. I was on juries with Christopher Lee and, uh, you know, people like that and, 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 you know, wonderful, talented people, a lot of great Japanese film directors and other actors in places like Brussels and Rome and Tuscany. And, and, and those are really a lot of fun to do. But when I'm I, I love to see the foreign memorabilia. This is the stuff I love the most. And it, I continue to discover stuff. A, a lot. I, the tie posters are very lurid, and they have high saturated color, and they really pick out interesting images. And oftentimes, the Asian publicists have access to uh, proof sheets and uh, photos taken on the set that are considered too violent or too lurid or too sexy for uh, North America. So it's really fun to see those images transposed uh, into into their advertising or on their posters. In fact, I recently, I, I, I've always, I've had for a long time the opening night Tokyo Japanese program, and I recently got the uh, opening night Japanese program for Freddy vs. Jason. And there are photo images inside uh, these these programs that I've never seen anywhere else. They're just amazing. Not only in color, but in black and white, too. Set stills and candid shots. A lot of them are almost like found footage or home movies stills. Uh, if you've ever seen the famous documentary that's out now uh, called Never Sleep Again uh, by yes, Helen Langkamp. She's the actress who plays Nancy. It's a lot like that. You see these images and these home movies uh, and Polaroid shots and uh, and video that you've never you never knew existed before. I mean, when I saw Never Sleep Again, my God, I I never realized that Peter Jackson, you know, wrote one of the drafts for one of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. So you learn a lot that way, and you see these images, and you kind of remember a photographer being there, and you kind of remember that day. But it's because it's it's some image of of of, of maybe just in between takes. And we're rehearsing or something, and it all you get this rush of memories back. So I love seeing that kind of stuff, and I'm on the quest for a Phantom of the Opera poster. That I, it's a great uh, image of me from Germany. So I'm still looking for that, and there's actually a Latvian, uh, one of the Russian satellite com- countries, Latvia or Estonia, uh, back in the early '80s, had a great. They have a great poster of Heather and I. That's just in black and white that I'm also seeking out now. But I'm I'm constantly new, seeing new stuff. I just saw a Nightmare on Elm Street one poster from Rome, and the claw in it hovers over the floating body of Heather, and Heather's sort of abstractly drawn, and the claw is coming out towards the viewer, and the claw in the poster is the claw that later we used as my hand. In Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 7, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. So someone on the special effects staff or crew of Nightmare on Elm Street 7 in 94 had seen this Italian illustration from 1984 and copied that or was inspired by that as their idea for the sort of morphing claw where Freddy's claw hand turns into bone. 
because the claw on that original 1984 Italian poster is made of bone. So it was just, it's, and I just discovered that earlier this year. So there's all sorts of cool stuff like that out there that, that I love to see when I'm at the, you know, when I'm at a con or at a film festival. Well, do you find yourself, uh, when you're at those type of functions, looking around and end up picking up new things to take home, would you? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm old school, and the stuff I get, is stuff that I, you know, I, I, I made peace with the sort of teenage fanboy that still lives deep inside Robert England. And I find myself getting the stuff I like or getting presents for people. I scored a great James Bond piece of memorabilia for a friend. And one of my earliest memories <clears throat> in the movies was my parents took me to the premiere as a young, young kid. I probably was four years old. Uh, but they took me to see, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea with James Mason and uh, Kirk Douglas. And the effects in that for the time were were just remarkable. And very good acting, Peter Lorre, and very good dialogue. And it's a Disney film. And uh, I found the original 1954 poster, a small one, uh, in Brussels, in Belgium, which is the the, the, the natural language of Jules Verne the writer of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the great, great science fiction author. So I've got it in, I've got 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in the native language, and I've got the original Disney poster, small size, so I have plenty of room on my wall for it from 1954. And uh, it's just, it's wonderful. It's just, it's the, the Nautilus on the bottom of the sea with all of the kind of Art Nouveau retro skin divers going to a funeral and burying somebody on the floor of the sea. It's really cool. Well, the movie, as we said, is the last showing. It's available now here in the U.S., both on iTunes and through your cable outlet for On Demand. Uh, Robert England is one of the stars in the movie, and as we mentioned throughout the interview here, if you happen to be in the Baltimore area, go check him out at Monster Mania. Get your stuff signed. He's a very personable guy. Robert, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and 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 for my fans, here's my my uh, my my stamp of approval. If you go see the last showing, or you download it, you'll never eat popcorn again. <laughs> Robert, thank you so much. Thank you.